Welcome to Friends in Fiction, five best-selling authors and the stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, Patty Callahan Henry, and Mary Alice Monroe are five longtime friends with more than 80 published books to their credit. In 2020, they created Friends in Fiction to provide author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing, and to highlight independent bookstores. These friends discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on Friends in Fiction, where we celebrate books, authors, and independent bookstores. Tonight, we are so thrilled to be joined by the incredible Jocelyn Jackson. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey, and I'll be your host tonight. I'm Patty Callahan Henry. I'm Mary Alice Monroe. I'm Mary Kay Andrews. I'm Kristen Harmel. Mary Kay, would you like to tell us about um, our Mama Geraldine? <laughs> Y'all, I'm sorry. I'm missing a beat tonight. Don't just pay me no mind. Um, <laughs> yeah, before we bring Jocelyn on, I want to tell, uh, tell everybody that we want to thank our partner, Mama Geraldine's. We love supporting this woman-owned business, and it is no surprise that Mama G's is the country's best-selling cheese straw. Remember, you can use the code FAB5 to get 20% off Mama Geraldine's at mamageraldine's.com. Snack on, y'all. We're also so glad to be partnering with Page One Books, a subscription box hand curated by a woman like Rachel, who spent her fifth birthday applying for a library card. <laughs> These are the people we want choosing our books. You get the personal touch of an indie bookstore with the delight and surprise of an online subscription service curated just for you and your taste. First time subscribers get 10% off with the code FAB5 at page1books.com. And it's the number one, not the word one, page one well, this week, I hope that a lot of you have already read Patty's amazing essay for our partnership with Parade.com about changing careers midstream and really about what we want to be when we grow up. <laughs> so this is kind of an open question and you can answer what you want to of it super briefly. Um, if you changed careers, you can tell us about that or you can tell us what you want to be when you grow up. If there are any dreams that are left unfulfilled that you really want to get moving on. Yeah. You know, I dreamed um, of being a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative newspaper reporter. And after 14 years in the 80s, newspapers changed. So I decided to become a mystery writer. And I did that. I wrote 10 mysteries. Then I had an idea for a different kind of a book. It had a mystery in it, but it really wasn't a category mystery. So I reinvented myself. That book was Savannah Blues. And um, I invented myself as Mary Kay Andrews. And, you know, I still have a lot of dreams to pursue, which I think keeps life interesting. Sure. It does. It does. You know, mm -hmm. I did that genre switch too. I started off writing chiclet and now I'm writing historical fiction, which is very different. Um, but as far as unfulfilled dreams that I have yet to achieve, I'm still waiting to be a, a pop star. I mean, it, it's going to oh, happen yes. for me Same. any day now. Yeah. Miss Mystica. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Mary Alice. Mary we Alice remembers. Mom, yes. <laughs> and any day now, guys, you're going to be seeing me at the Grammys. Right. You're going to be the biggest <laughs> thing ever. We cannot wait. <laughs> Well, they say you're going to change your your careers or your jobs five times in a lifetime, and I've done four. When I, I was a writer, when I was a little girl, I always wanted to be that when I grew up. But then I actually did write writing for hire, but for a short time in journalism, and I totally switched and got my degrees in Japanese. And I was a teacher in Japanese, and then I taught English as a second language, so as a teacher, and then I went to bed with my third pregnancy. And I wrote my novel, and I'm where I'm supposed to be. I never want to change again. Five <laughs> times the charm. 
<laughs> Sorry, so I like that. you're not going to come on the road as part of my rock band? Is that what you're oh, saying? Oh, there's always that. No, I've got okay. a tambourine Phew. in my hand. You All right. <laughs> the tambourine would be, be about the only thing I could play in any band. <laughs> when I grew up, you know, my dad is a preacher and I had to be in the choir and I can't sing. So they always just gave me the tambourines or the little finger. The triangle. Symbols. What about the triangle? <laughs> the triangle. The triangle. I, I even, I I even the triangle. wanted to play no, more the cowbell. accordion. <laughs> more cowbell. <laughs> Um, yeah, the essay I wrote was about um, changing careers midstream and this idea of that it's never too late to become and change. And it happened for me when I asked my daughter when she was six years old, and I'm with her right now, and she has a two-year-old, so it seems a million years ago. And I said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she said, I want to be a writer of books. And I said, no, that's what I want to be when I grow up. And she said, you're already grown up. And that's when poof, everything yeah. changed. Yeah. So what about now? Any Anything anything <laughs> else on your bucket list that you like really need to do? <laughs> no, I think, I think like Mary Kay said, there's always other dreams to fulfill. But mm -hmm. I think at this stage in our life, it's never too late. You know, you no. can always say, mm -hmm. and I changed genres completely yeah. mm -hmm. and retaught myself a whole new skill set. And, mm -hmm. you know, if there's something else that I see that answers that question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Mm -hmm. um, it's something interesting to ask ourselves every once in a while oh, and sit yeah. and hear what the answer might be, you know? Yeah. I think I've told y'all this before on the show, but I'll mention it again, that I have this recurring dream about writing a song with James Taylor. So I feel yeah. like that is in my life path. And I was telling a group that I was at dinner with on Saturday night about this, and they were like very into it. They were like, well, I mean, you need to get on that. And like, you know, y'all both have UNC and da, da 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 And like all these like things, I was like, guys, I don't know that I think this is like actually gonna happen. Like, it's just a dream I have, but you know, hey, strange. Hey. You never know. One step. And, but I bet every single one of us, every single one, if somebody would have said to us yeah. years and years before we had books published, there's going to be a day when you're going to be a best selling author, having a show about authors and writing. We go, right. uh huh. Yeah. Well, I was yeah. working night shift as the nurse, or Kathy, yeah. you were working night. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If yeah. someone had said to me that I would know any of you, I would have been like, yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Sure, yeah, I, let me tell you, 40 years ago, I was covering <laughs> Disney on Ice, and I brought that yes. with the pinnacle of my, <laughs> but, well, I have reached the pinnacle of my career. I have, I have covered, you know, <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't well, know, Mystica still calls. Yes. <laughs> yeah. oh, James and I will write your first hit single. Oh, Mystica. there you go. Oh, that's awesome. Maybe, awesome. maybe if you're lucky, I'll let you and James open for me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. I'll play the triangle. Okay. All yes. of this. Cool. You want to play the? You want the tambourine? I'll do the finger symbol. I want the triangle. Keyboard. You want the tambourine? I'll play the keyboard. I'll, keyboard. I'll give up the tambourine. So, guys, okay, someone, on to Jocelyn. Okay. Speaking of someone that has really amazing dreams and has accomplished a lot, now on to the reason we're here, our guest. <laughs> Jocelyn Jackson is the New York Times bestselling author of nine novels, including her latest spectacular Mother May I, which just released yesterday. Um, in the vein of changing careers, she's also a trained actress. And let me say, if you have not listened to one of the audiobooks that she has narrated, you are missing out. Yeah. So tonight, she's going to be telling us about the inspiration behind her latest novel, her real life philanthropic endeavors. And of course, you'll all have the chance to ask your questions live. So go ahead and get them in now. Let's welcome Jocelyn. Hey! Hi! Yeah. Author, Hi. author. We're Thank so excited you. you're here. Hello. I'm excited to be here. Well, let's talk a little bit about this riveting new novel, Mother May I. I just have to say the title even kind of like gives me chills. Like it's oh. just, it's so good. I love it. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about your book? Sure. It's a story of a one. I, I don't know. If you've been in charge of a kid for more than 90 <laughs> seconds at a time. I know you've had the experience where you look up and that kid is just gone. Yep. Yep. And yep. every time they've squirted under a bush to look at a lizard or they're mm -hmm. like the wallpaper yeah. behind the sofa. Um, <laughs> that Because they're weird. That's not what happens to Brie, my narrator. 
he looks up and her son is gone. The baby, he's 10 weeks old and he's gone. And in his place is a note that Ooh. says, don't go home, don't call your husband, don't call the police, just do what I say. And if you've read any of my books ever before, you know this is not a straight up kidnap and ransom thing. In all of my books, the past has a pulse, the past has teeth, it's coming for Brie. It's a little bit of a revenge fantasy as well as oh, being wow. a thriller, which I really like. So, <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, I have to say, it's uh, the title says a lot. <laughs> it really <laughs> does. <laughs> it does. And the great cover, by the way. And for me, you talked about how one of the most important keys to your success overall is that you married a partner who supports you. Yes. And we all know that carries over to every aspect of your work to that, you know, the pressure you have to have someone there behind you. And I have to say, I'm really lucky in that respect too. And you also talked about the inequality of women and work and how that was really spotlighted during the pandemic. And so can you describe to everyone how these ideas show up in your novel? Oh, sure. Um, so I, I think that's kind of a running theme in a, in a lot of my work, honestly. Yeah. Like, mm. A thing that's very true about me is I'm not really interested in writing. I, I write women. I'm much more interested in women's lives. Uh, that's what I want to write about. And I want... Like I want my women to be people who act, not people who react, because mm. I think women are sort of seen as reactors more than actors. Mm -hmm. And um, like, I, you know, like when I talk about the things that my husband does for me then the things he's done that have made my career possible, people just act like it's this crazy, oh, that's just so weird and amazing. I don't know a male writer who doesn't have a wife like yeah. Oh, good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like he doesn't. He the things he does. If he was my wife, nobody would mm -hmm. blink. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good point. So true. Yeah. But also for the, do you think that the women during the pandemic? I, I mean, I've been reading a lot about women too, about how they they're stuck home with the kids and their jobs, trying to do it. It just seemed to really be a time yeah, when. And their jobs, and women are also taking care of the relatives, the elderly relatives who are yes, yes. Like, yeah. And so, so many women have like the jobs that have been lost are almost all female jobs as women are sort of returning home. Yeah. So many. Yeah, such a good point. So one of the things that fascinates me as a writer is how nimbly you move between genres. So you're both an accomplished women's fiction author and a writer of these page-turning domestic suspense stories. So can you tell us a little bit about how, like, whether your process differs when you're writing different kinds of novels? And are there common threads that you find when you're kind of going from genre to genre? Now, I mean, not just in your own writing, but kind of in the genres or maybe just books in general, or are there threads that take you from one to another? Um, yeah, I kind of did the Mary Kay Andrews thing and the <laughs> thing that you did where I I have changed genres after writing eight women's fiction wow. Southern novels. I'm straight up writing domestic thrillers now. That's awesome. And uh, for me, it was an accident. Like I wish oh. that I was smart, but I'm, I just, I'm very instinctive and I run everything from my lizard brain, you know, this <laughs> I don't even know. It's all back here, but um, if you look at my my first eight books, I was always killing somebody. In my first seven <laughs> novels, I killed somebody in Alabama, like, and it was set in Mississippi, and I would cross state lines, kill somebody in Alabama, and then go back to the book. <laughs> I just, like, True. Realize like I could murder someone in Georgia, but so there was always this thread. <laughs> Domestic suspense running through yeah. my books. Oh my gosh. Days. And I think what happened was I hit 50. Like I'm Southern and I'm a I'm a lady person. And I just I'm a lady, lady person. Lady, I'm real nice. Like I want you to think I'm real, real nice. So I would put stuff around the murder that would convince you that I'm a very sweet That's person. Awesome. I am not. And now that I'm 50, too my far. yeah. Oh, so true. Now that I'm just, I never broke. And it was just like those storylines I'd been wanting to write just That's rose awesome. to the surface. 
does do you feel more like you that you're writing these stories now? I mean, I I do. Like I feel like I am am yeah. the self I'm meant to be because I've gotten to the place I I am. Do you feel like that with the books you're writing maybe, now? Maybe more like I'm the self I am now because I will say mm. this: like writing Southern fiction, there were things I wanted to say about the South that I mm-hmm. tried I tried to say, and I really feel like with the Almost Sisters. I said one of the things I've been trying to say, like, I'm never going to say it any better. And so it's sort of released. I mean, I'm sure other people have said it better, but I'm not going to be able to say it any better. So Mm -hmm. it kind of released me from that and let me lean in and have a little more murdery fun. (laughs) I love it. That's awesome. So not so so much a mistake. Kind of uh, the intention was there. Sure. Well, not, yeah. a, it, not a mistake. A, a, what'd you say? A sneak in, or what was the word you used? A happy accident, or accident. Um, yeah, yeah, or or just instinctive as opposed to intellectual. So, are you no. a plotter or a pantser, or did this sort of like does it change Pantser's. for you? No, yeah. I wish I was a plotter. Okay. So even in me, even in your domestic suspense, you are yeah. okay. Interesting. Yeah. I have no idea what's going to happen, but I know the characters really, really well, like really yeah. well. Okay. And everything, even it, like n- another thing that hasn't changed for me is my, my fiction is really character driven. Like it, all mm-hmm. the suspense comes out of who these people are and how they're in relationship with each other. Mm-hmm. So, um, so, and that hasn't changed and my process hasn't changed. I, mm-hmm. I honestly don't feel my books have changed that much. Like, I think that the the only real change moving from one genre to the next is that these these thrillers have a bigger, faster engine where like yeah. the art is like and now they are <laughs> You're so funny. So before I dive in, I have to tell everyone at Friends in Fiction that Surviving Savannah is a better book because of you, Jocelyn. So when I was writing Surviving Savannah, I had a dive scene for those of you who have read it. And I called Jocelyn just for one question. She said immediately, send me the whole scene. I'm not just giving you one piece of advice. So um, thank you, Jocelyn. But what I want to talk about what is a she's little... saying is that I'm a pain in the butt. Like I'm a scuba diving pain in the butt who wanted to <laughs> it was it was actually very detailed, but pain <laughs> in the butt. Listen, for all of us, we know, especially not even especially historical fiction, because that had nothing to do with the history. If you get no. that wrong, I get the letter. Right. Yeah. right. I get totally. the letter from the diver who tells yep. me what I got wrong. And I don't yeah. want that letter. We are psychotic about it. Like jo- scuba divers, I don't know. Uh, there's not many casual scuba divers I know. The people who do it <laughs> are like, I am going to, when can I go scuba diving again? Like my husband and I are <laughs> rabid, rabid divers. And I went once. And the second time I went, I couldn't, I swore there was no oxygen in the tank. And I've never been again. So <laughs> what? <laughs> What I want to talk to you about is about a little bit more than the book, as fabulous and twisty and wonderful as it is, you have a fascinating and world changing passion project. And I know that I've, we've talked about it and, but you volunteer in women's prisons where you say that you have learned a lot about class, about privilege, privilege, about poverty and about who gets second chances and when, and then the way that role affects the outcome in your life. So I want you to talk a little bit about that and how it influenced this novel. So reformingarts.org is a small nonprofit based here in Georgia. Um, We're in partnership with a lot of other nonprofits and we're also in partnership with Georgia State University. So when we go into the prisons, we are offering a degree seeking program. And pre-pandemic, I taught with them as a volunteer for seven years. Um, Yeah. Currently, we're mostly focused on our reentry program. So returning citizens, like helping them process trauma, find job and educational opportunities. Um, That's sort of what we're looking at until we can get back into the prisons and continue our, like we have students who are in mid degree who are trying to change their lives, who nobody can get in there because it's so dangerous. Mm -hmm. Um, For me, as a person who is, I mean, look at me. Look, at, you look at me. Don't I look like I'm about to rise up and organize a bake sale? I am. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what are you saying? I, don't. <laughs> I just, I just, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a. 
if I get pulled over for speeding or whatever, and I, like, I don't know, I've, I'm not going to, people believe me when I talk. Like, you look at me, I'm white, I'm middle class, I'm, I'm clearly a person who's had education. I have, I use big words. I'm, um, everything about me is palatable and makes police want to be nice to me. I look like a citizen. Yeah. And if you are poor, if you mm -hmm. are of color, if you don't come out of the kind of family I came out of where I was loved and nurtured and supported and taught, you know, how to be connective and all that kind of stuff, the way you present yourself, you're not going to get, you, you might be doing absolutely nothing wrong, yeah. but the, in the same way that people look at me and think she's on her way to a bake sale. If you, if I was black and if I was poor or if I were any, or not working class, but like just in that kind of abject poverty, we don't like to look at in this country. I would not be given all of the second chances and assumptions. Right. Yep. And if you're in it, you don't even notice it. Like, you don't notice it. And, and this book is definitely, like, I want to write a thriller where you are welcome to make yourself a giant aviation and go down to the beach and read it and have a good time. And Lord be with you. Enjoy. That's what it's for. But also, if you have a book club and you want to talk about issues of class and race and especially justice, like, this is a revenge story. This is a story about who gets second chances and um and and I, I didn't even get second chances. I've gotten like 486 chances. <laughs> so <laughs> many, so many restarts and do-overs I've been just blessed with and given. And sometimes if you are a person who doesn't come across in those ways, like you, you get chance. one chance. Yeah. Yeah. And if you mess up that one chance, it's very easy for people to be like, well, she had a chance and she yeah. blew it. Yeah. Without ever seeing how many chances they've had. And the, and that's what this book is. I'm not good at left and right. That's what this book is about. <laughs> it's three yard. It can't it's yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Well said. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Wait. I mean, Jocelyn, just thinking about um, the women that you have met and the women that you have touched by doing this work. Um, how could it possibly not at some point work its way mm -hmm. into your creative work? Because oh. you are always like your antenna are always up. You're always paying attention. There's no way that something that powerful and impactful cannot find its way into your and creative unjust. work. And yeah. unjust. Like it really yeah. rankles me. It's, it's unjust. It yeah. is unjust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that's something um, more and more of us, are thinking about these days, um, un unfairness. Mm -hmm. I mean, my mother always used to say, who taught you, who told you life was fair? And, um, you know, I kind of thought it was, and then you get out in the world and you go, well, no, it's not. All right. And speaking of ch children and motherhood, um, we can't have you on to talk about a book called mother. May I, without talk, without asking you to talk about motherhood, one of the most interesting to, things to me about this novel is, and I hope this is not a spoiler, the kidnapper is actually a mother herself. Yeah, and so that's a spoiler. You learn that so quickly, and I would right. love to talk about that. Yeah. Um, she Bree really understands, right, that despite the trauma um, that she is putting her through, the kidnapper, she understands the kidnapper. How does... Talk to us about how motherhood and different aspects of motherhood, what kind of a role does that play in this story? So, uh, you know, obviously Stockholm syndrome is at work, but um, the you, if somebody has that much power over you, you need to invest them with something you can love or else you're it's too terrifying. Like, you know, the psychology of that. Mm -hmm. So that's at play. But it's also true that the person who has Robert is a mother and Brie comes to like she also like Brie is this Brie is a person who grew up on the very bottom rung, just clinging to middle class, like the kind of thing where you're not mm -hmm. food insecure and you have a place to live, but like the car breaks down, it's a major yeah. emergency. You're yeah. homeless, but, so but yeah. she's been very upwardly mobile. She got a scholarship, she married really well, and she's just moved this way. She's and that's my life trajectory too. Like 
She's now upper middle class. Well, this woman started in the same place and her trajectory went the other way. Oh, and she thinks Bree's like this rich trophy wife, but as they're talking and as this, you know, as this plays out, they she comes to understand that she and Bree are very much alike. And Bree comes to understand that too. And they they're both like they get all this empathy for each other, even though each of them is fighting for their own child. So they're mm -hmm. heading for consecration. There's no way for that. You, If it's your kid, you're going to blow up the universe, right? You have to. Right. Even as they're heading toward this conflagration, they, they, they come to really understand each other. It's one of my favorite things about the book. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, kind of the respect for the combatants on the field, right? Right, right. Yeah. yeah. It's like, you know, the, the stories about World War II when the, they're in the trenches and, and, you know, somebody rises up out of the German side, somebody rises up out of the American side and they kind of yeah. nod at each other. Yeah. 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 Well, Jocelyn, as you might know every, well, as you definitely know, because you helped us with this this week, every week we highlight an independent bookstore to encourage our viewers to support indies who are the bedrocks of our communities. So especially, um, tonight as we're celebrating small communities. So Jocelyn, why did you choose Little Shop of Stories? So this is a, a book about motherhood and Little Shop of Stories is our local children's book stops. All the moms are in there all the time. Yeah. Um, and I, I picked it for a couple of reasons. First of all, because um, they do have a very small, highly curated adult fiction section and they always sell my books there which makes me feel really good because it's yes. a very small thing and also because in um brie is a mom and in mother may i her daughter like it, it's kind of funny like here's this her whole world is blowing up she's ditched her daughters at her mother's house so the, the daughters have no idea any of this is going on mm -hmm. and her her oldest daughter who's like 13 is like I need I am Malala for my book report. <laughs> it's just like this this weird little thing happens where here she is in the middle of this conflagra conflagration and there's this child who needs their their blue hoodie and their and she's like, go to Little Shop of Stories and buy a copy. Mom is busy, you know. <laughs> That's great. So it's in the book. Yeah. It's so great. It's so that's great. A great a, yeah, that's a great store. I um I read all, you know, all of us get all these emails from bookstores because we love them and we're on their mailing list. And so when I get an email from uh, Little Shop about, uh, especially my grandkids love YA, it's great. I can call there or I can, uh, you know, text or email mm -hmm. and they'll have the book wrapped and waiting um, at the that's door. Awesome. And that's an amazing thing. Yeah, and they do. They they always do. They do gift wrap, and it's beautiful. Oh, I love the gift wrapping. Gift wrap is the best, and yeah. they do great I, events too. I just want to say this does have the word mother in the title. Mother Day. Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. There you go. Mary, they will wrap it for you, and it will be pretty. Like they're wrapping papers. <laughs> that is exactly what I was going to say. Is that books make such great Mother's Day gifts, and Little Shop of Stories is offering a ten percent discount on Mother May I, as well as um, the five of our new and upcoming releases. And all you have to do to get your discount is mention Friends and Fiction in the comments and. Request gift wrap, I think, because that sounds really yeah. great. Presentation's <laughs> coming up too. So. It's free. The gift wrap is free. They just do it. That's so um, great. Yeah. What a nice touch. I truly choose my stores and what I purchase based on who gift wraps, like hands down. No, I really <laughs> oh do because I hate to gift wrap. I'm bad at it. <laughs> I'm bad at it. Well, we have had our chance to ask questions to Jocelyn, and now it is our viewers' turn. So, Mary, um, Alice, would you like to start us off? I will. I have a question from Georgette Perkins, and I think we had this question before. We had such fun with the answers. So here you are. <laughs> do you ever talk to your characters while writing a book? Oh, I would love to say no, because it's <laughs> <laughs> we know I, you do, Jocelyn. I know. It's so embarrassing. Okay, we could have voted what your answer was. I bet we would have all, all right. said yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. I do. And so I come out of theater. My background is in theater. I don't just talk to them. I talk as them. Mm. That's, oh, wow. that's, that's a good answer. That's cool. Yeah. 
and sometimes in the car, like I tend to really think about my books when I'm bored, like, and Me too. I, yeah, yeah. Bored, being bored is important. And mm -hmm. I will be <laughs> in the car mm -hmm. and I will be like in a fight between two characters mm -hmm. and I will look <laughs> over and see like somebody staring at me and then I have to pretend like it's, you know, queen or something, you know, like. You <laughs> <singing? laughs> Hold up your phone. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking yeah, about that's that. right. Right. Oh, right. Tap your oh, ear like hilarious. there's an earphone in it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got a question from Anissa Armstrong, Hello. and she says, Anissa says, Mother May I is definitely one of the books that you cannot put down. She loved it, and she has great taste. She does. You know, you've narrated all of your books before. Why did you decide to narrate them? And has that been difficult? And I think you kind of already answered that because obviously you talk to your characters and they talk back, and then you just talk into a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if it's, one, it's, if it's my own book, it's very easy because I've heard them and I've been doing their voices for a year and a half while I was writing the book. But I also narrate for other people too. And sometimes you like, I really only do it if I like the book. Like I'm not, I, I it's, it's not a thing I have to do. It's a thing I love to do. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do it just enough to qualify for a SAG card every year, which makes yeah. me happy. And I only take oh. books I really love. And then sometimes you'll, a writer that you really love will ask you to read it and you'll be like, oh my God. And you'll be so honored and you'll take the job. And then you'll read the book and realize that you have to learn to do an Irish accent. Oh, that was mine. <laughs> That's the hard part like, is the accent. But anyway, that was, like, um, that was the bookshop at Water's End. Yeah. Oh, that's that. awesome. No, The Favorite Daughter. No. You read The Favorite Daughter. The Favorite yeah, Daughter. You read The Favorite Daughter for me. She was my yeah. audio narrator. Yeah, I did one great. of Patty's books. I was so excited when she asked me to do it. And then oh, uh, so I was like, I could do that. Patty always, I love Patty's books, so I know I'm going to love it. Oh. I know it's going to be set in the South. I'll be able to do all the accents. And then I'm like, oh, they're all Irish. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. And the director was actually Irish. Oh so. no, even worse. Yeah. I, I do my own audiobooks, but I, I didn't do um the one with all the foreign accents uh, because I am not trained in acting like you are. But I have to say, I, I just I nod to you for that. Hmm. Yeah, I, I can only do Irish when you get a couple Guinnesses in me, and then I'm not very good at reading anything. So <laughs> She thinks she can do Irish. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's horrible. But it feels good to me when I'm a couple Guinnesses in. I'll right. Tell you. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was not a lot, to be fair. I'm just there was not a lot of Irish. No, in no, no. It was like a couple sentences. Yeah. <laughs> but, but still, you labored. Yeah. You labored. I know. Well, so but we're going to... I was going to say, we're going to take a couple questions from the live feed. And this one is kind of a good follow-up to that. So it's from Pam Erickson Gardo. And she says, you're such an amazing and skillful narrator. Can you tell us a little bit more about the process of creating the audiobook and how you actually prepare for it, other than learning Irish accents? <laughs> no, I don't prepare for it at all if it's my book. Because why would I? Like, I know exactly what every line should sound like. I go into the studio. It's I mean, I will do some of the voices with my husband, whose master's degree is in theater. Like, this is how I met him, actually. We did summer yeah. stock theater together. And oh, the first I time that. I ever saw him, he was learning sword fighting on stage. Uh, how do you know that guy? Yeah. <laughs> right? you have to. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, <laughs> Well, he'll help me. Like he'll listen to me, and he'll be like, "I know it sounds that way in your head, but you need to drop it a little bit." Like he's very oh, great. Cool. At that. Hmm. But if it's somebody else's book, then I I spend a lot more time. That's why I don't do it very often because it's a lot more prep work. Where yeah. I read the book a couple of times, and I make a list of the important characters, and I practice voices a lot more with my husband until I get a a good sense of it, like that. Oh. Yeah. Awesome. And then it's just four days. It's three to five days in the studio, depending on how long the book is. And you just read it and you have a director in your ear and you have a sound engineer. It's fun. Mm -hmm. I, I love it. It's a way to be back in theater, which was my young womanhood and my first love. But it's a lot of hard work. I mean, you sit still, your stomach can't growl, your tongue gets tired. You're, it, it's not easy. So I, I give that nod to you again. 
Did you read Mother May I? Mm -hmm. okay. I did. Oh. How did you do that in the pandemic? I did not read one because of the pandemic. I didn't well, go to the studio. Well, the the studio where I read is um is in the East Atlanta Village, and mm -hmm. I I mean I've worked with them for so long, and they told me what their protocols would be. Mm -hmm. Like only one reader would use a studio at a time, and they had an air filter running in there the whole time. Oh, it's nice. Right? Right. I would go in there and clean it myself. Like mm -hmm. it would be. And you would just go in and go to your box and then you would just stay like you would bring your own lunch. You would really only leave to go to the bathroom. Wow. And you and the sound engineer are in different places. Mm -hmm. And the whole time you're reading, like they've had an air filter running all night and nobody else goes in that studio. Great. Great. Awesome. And you're right. alive, so it must have worked. Yeah. <laughs> you're still here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking it worked. Yeah. Also, okay. you know, shots. Yeah. Yep. Shots. Okay, so Leisha Haney wants to know, do your book characters, which I want to know too, we all know now you talk to your characters and you have conversations mm -hmm. in the car, but she said, do your book characters talk back to you? And if they do, have you had to change something because of it? Ooh, oh, oh, I know. That's when I know the book is working. Like I'm a pantser, like we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I know the book is working when the, the narrator begins to do things that make me wildly uncomfortable. And it used to be that I would fight the narrator and try to write nicer. Mm. And then I would end up with, you know, n n as long as I fought, all of that would have to be thrown away. I'm better mm -hmm. now to where when a narrator starts wanting to do something that makes me really uncomfortable, I realize I'm writing mm. toward the book. Mm -hmm. I love what you just said. I wanted to fight the narrator and make them nicer. Could we just sum up being Southern right there? That yeah, that's <laughs> I exactly to right. Fight the narrator and make her nicer. Yeah. Okay. Oh, man. So awesome. I have to ask you this because I think it's so funny. So Sue Johnson Bishop said, "Does your husband read your books and is he scared?" <laughs> that's awesome. Yes, he reads all my books before oh, they amazing. even go to my editor, and then he reads them once they're out. He's like my big. Fan and he oh, I love that. Him. He I thinks I'm that. pretty. <laughs> <laughs> As he well should, which yeah. is a bonus always. The best. Like, yes, yes. The only person I let read my books before my husband reads them is actually my mother. Because mm -hmm. I will let my mother read them right out, like first draft when they're genuinely terrible, because mm -hmm. she has no idea they're terrible. Mm -hmm. It's like my drawing of a ship I did when I was five, and she was like, This this is the best ship. I know your mother. Writer. And she's like that about my books. Like I'll send her complete crap and she'll be like, well, I think it's your best one. And then I'll <laughs> read it and I'll send it to her when it's actually good. And she'll be like, I just didn't see how you could make it any better, but you did. Like, oh, that's awesome. That's, that's awesome. exactly how my mom is. And I send her the really tragic, trashy first draft and she'll be like oh it's just amazing and I only found a few little things and I'm like mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> a few little things <laughs> Never like a whole plot a line thing. missing. Yeah, like, like, like you actually messed up the entire timeline, but it's fine. No one would have noticed. <laughs> I don't know if it's like capable awesome. of seeing that. I mean, she can see it in other people's books very easily, but in my book, she can't see the flaws. She thinks it's the best. She's just so, I mean, she literally is blind to it in this very biased <laughs> Kind of lovely way. That's her job as your mother is to right. cool. bolster your right. bolster your up. Yeah. That's right. Well, one of our favorite parts of the show is listening to our guest authors' writing tips. And so, Jocelyn, we know that you have an amazing piece of advice that you can offer to all the writers listening in, and more importantly, to the five of us on this screen. <laughs> you hear me? And all of you know this. We, I had, I could say a million things, but because of the way the conversation has gone, I'm going to say this: the best thing you can do for yourself as a writer is put yourself in a situation where you're bored. Mm -hmm. um, your writing brain will kick on to entertain you. Take, take long, you know, yeah. Go see the world's largest ball of twine and drive mm -hmm. or clean out a closet you want you have a problem with your chapter go like fix your child's closet it yeah. will have resolved itself 
<laughs> but you can't do those things while listening to an audio book or a podcast. No, or, uh, you, you just have to let your mind wander. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you maybe put on music if you're the kind of person that doesn't notice music or you put on a kind of backgroundy sort of music, but that's it. Make your, mm -hmm. give your brain like a big open field where it doesn't like, you know, the, the worst mm -hmm. thing about this pandemic is like everybody's watching, like Netflix is always there because you're already at home. Yeah. You've got to like clear yeah, space off. for your own mm -hmm. space. Um, So while we're talking about writing, what book have you read lately that you have loved and want to share with us? Well, Yay! Yes. 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 Can't Good. You got an early copy, lucky you. I did. Well, I'm interviewing her. I had to be vetted. Oh, I, had to be vetted. I don't know wow. what that means. But I don't I know how you got through the vetting. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Broken like a twelve friend. Books, Jacqueline? Come on. Oh. I think that I think that they saw that during her campaign and then after I had the money shovel. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm clearly already a huge fan of this woman, and this is just so fun it's really good i can't i'm excited okay. to talk with her about it it's a really good book it's i like thrillers as you know and this is kind of a political it's a it's a it's a burner i guess i would call it oh. and you were vetted before you came on the show and used the phrase murdery fun so <laughs> which is a great <laughs> phrase by the way right. and somewhere like stacy abrams publicist is pushing a button going no no <laughs> <laughs> Unvet her, but yeah, she's um, so that would be my and it, like she, her tour is being set up right now and it's almost it's ticketed and it'll be limited. So if you are interested in any of the conversations she's going to be doing online, you should Google that nonsense and get your ticket. Oh, good, okay. thank you. Love it. Does anybody else have a recommendation? I think Patty, you might have had one. I just wanted to mention and remind everyone because she's been on our show, Leon Dolan, her satellite sisters, the book we yeah. all love so much, is out in paperback yesterday. So yeah. I want to tell everybody about that. And um, Mary Kay will be telling us more later. She's going to be with her sisters on our Mother's Day show. So yeah. Love it. Well, we're all going to be with the sisters. Yeah, we're on all. The Mother's Day show. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't know if you guys saw it in our newsletter, but a couple of weeks ago, we recommended a debut called Waiting for the Night Song by Julie Carrick Dalton. So I just wanted to mention that on the show. It's a beautiful, beautiful debut novel. It has had tons of acclaim. And um, with Earth Day right around the corner coming up, it's a really good time to read it. So if you haven't checked that out, it's a great opportunity to support a debut author and read a really beautiful book. So Jocelyn, we have one final question for you that's coming up right after a few announcements. So everybody hold tight. I just want to mention one more time, Page One Books. It's a wonderful curate bookstore that curates. We have so many books we want to read. You know, especially if I hear from our fans all the time. My TBR pile is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, Page One Books talks to you, figures out what you love. They curate your books and you get a book every month meant just for you. So every single week, it's like your birthday. It's really wonderful. And it's in Evanston where I was born. So I'm particularly fond of page one books. Yes. And, and it's a wonderful place. And I hope you all give it a try. Yeah. And um, let's talk about our partner, Mama Geraldine's or Mama G, as we call her on the show. Mm -hmm. Makes the best that. cheese. Yeah, we're about that. <laughs> uh, Mama G's makes the best cheese straws on the planet. So go to mamageraldines.com, plug in Fab Five, and you will get a very nice discount. I'm going to do that right after I get off. I have a cheese straw oh. problem. Oh, so my gosh. Good. You're going to go crazy. So, so good. We can enable Mama you. Mama good. Awesome. We, we can, can enable, enable this you. problem. Oh, oh my as gosh. a good Southern girl, and uh, I think one time I said, you'll get this as a good Southern girl. Their cheese straw is so good, you can take them to the church picnic and it'll be just fine. <laughs> 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 I kind of feel like cheese. I got one of those used to be when you got married in the 70s you got this this thing that would allegedly make cheese straws 
<laughs> so you made the dough <laughs> and you had to like squeeze it out. <laughs> all I, never got that. I remember that. I've yeah, never got my, that. Yeah, my cheese straws look like spermatozoa every <laughs> single one. <month. laughs> <laughs> so oh I was, I finally, you know, gave away, gave that away, oh, and now dear. I buy, I buy it's my just, cheese straws I from know, Mama G's. Mama G's, yeah. yeah. And so Cheese straws is a love language. If I give you cheese straws, or <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. I think we have to use that. Cheese straws are love language. My love language. I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, all of you out there, we have so much great stuff coming up. So next week, join us for our special celebration of our one year anniversary. Can you believe we've been doing this one for a year? year. One year. So on our show next week, we're going to have the one and only Jody Pico. And I know so many of you have asked for her. You've been asking for her all year. We finally have her. We're so excited. Yeah. So in the meantime, visit our page for great giveaways, like a custom-made 12-inch Dino Retro Desk Lamp in teal and white, which is worth $319, which is amazing, um, yeah. from our friends at Barnlight Electric, plus any first-year Friends in Fiction guests' book of the winner's choice. So more information is available on our Facebook page. Um, and we're just going to be having fun all month long, including our April 21st episode. We will be celebrating this very special book, which is our <laughs> own Christy Woodson Harvey's release <laughs> of Under the Southern Sky. Yeah. We're so excited. Thank you. So don't I'm miss so next excited. week and then don't miss Christy's big launch the week after that. Well, thank so you. And, and Erica, I think you have a video you might be able to share for us of some of the very special moments from our very special <laughs> first year, just to sort of whet everyone's appetite a little bit for um, our wonderful celebratory episode. Yay. So, so someone saying, hey, don't do this, that just tells me I'm on the right track if I <laughs> believe in this. But, you know, the, the, the human things, they don't change. The human things are what ties us all together. Um, that love of family, that need to know your history, that need to know your people. Um, you know, that, and that, that's the tie, that's the bond we have that makes us all the same, I think. Because I barely graduated from high school. I mean, I did. I, I struggled for years to learn how to read. And uh, but I think oh. it's just kind of God's joke. You know, he takes somebody who didn't learn to read and makes them a best-selling author. It certainly changed my life completely because I felt so grateful to live. Mm -hmm. So profoundly thankful. Um, and I thought, I am strong enough to get through this. So many people are not and they stay silent, but I want anyone who thinks they can speak about it to say, this happened to me and I'm not ashamed. It is not my, not my shame that this happened. It is the shame of the person who did this to me and I will not let him pull me down. Women particularly, we all, women particularly, need to do something at least once in our life that takes our own breath away. I love that. And I remember sitting back thinking, okay, this is mine. This is mm. mine. <laughs> so it did sort of initially take my breath that I would kind of go way, way out on the literary limb with this. But um, I was very compelled to do it. And I never looked back after that. That was amazing. Wow. I kept I, nodding I, I my head. Like, yeah. yeah. I would totally yeah. watch that show. Yeah. And we got to watch Kristen's bangs grow out. Like it, it was like <laughs> all our hair got longer. <laughs> That's so funny. And okay. then you think about that next year, Jocelyn. Next year we'll have a clip of Jocelyn. Right. On our exactly. second That's birthday. Right. Discussing murder. Talking about fun. murdery bits or <laughs> yeah. uh, lizard murdery brain, all those or, things. Or, or yeah. the, the, the roller coaster, right? Like the. <sighs> yeah. Oh, you know, you look at all the, those guests and there are more to come. It's pretty yeah. amazing. So, yeah. so fun. All right, Jocelyn, one final question, and it's my favorite. Okay. 
that we ask every week. We love asking about the values around reading and writing growing up. What they were for you, how you how they how you think they made you a writer or didn't, and even in for this novel. I I, I had the kind of, you know, we moved around a lot when I was growing up. Um, and I had the kind of mother who would find the library before she found the Piggly Wiggly. The common had, thread. Yeah. Yeah. That and she read aloud to me. And like when we would move again, you know, it would be someplace a year and then we'd move and I would leave my school and my friends. But I knew like. Trixie Belden would be waiting for me and Nancy Drew would be waiting for me and Tony and the Barbarian would be waiting for me. <laughs> oh, I love that. And these were my, my ongoing friends. So, yeah. And she read aloud to me, like, when when my brother and I were babies and being, you know, colicky nightmares, she would just walk us and she would just read whatever she was reading aloud just to... Oh, us wow. That's a beautiful image. Yeah. So I was being, like, I read... Like F. Scott Fitzgerald when I was two weeks old. And yelled at <laughs> wow. That's incredible. That's awesome. And I think we found that almost every time, almost, I'd love to look up the percentage, y'all. When we ask that question, somebody oh. says the libraries. When yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's a tribute. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Well, Jocelyn, you have been the most incredible guest. Um, thank you so much for being here to celebrate the launch of Mother May I with us tonight. Um, I know everyone on Friends of Fiction is going to rush right over to Little Shop of Stories and purchase your fabulous new book and mention Friends in Fiction in the comments for 10% off. So thank you. so much. book too. Like, yeah. Get a couple. Think too, they're small. Get a few. They are. <laughs> They are. Yeah, like, well, so thank you. A discount on anybody's book here. So why stop with one? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I love it. I love Especially it. with yeah. the wrapping. Come on. Yes. Exactly. yes. This, this looks so oh. nice. Gift wrapped. I think. Yes. <laughs> Mother's Day. Mother's <laughs> Day. Mother May I. I'm just saying. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, amazing. I'm, I'm sure marketing did not think of that at all. Oh, not at all. all. Yeah. Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. <laughs> but I can. Yeah. Thank you well, guys for having me. I, you guys are so much fun, and and I think you're just doing a great stuff for authors and books. And I just appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, Thank love you. having you on. And best we of luck with the rest you. of your launch week. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that is our show for tonight. If you've missed episodes, you can catch them on our website at friendsandfiction.com or on our YouTube page, as well as parade.com. It's Facebook, where every week one of us offers an essay on life. And check out our podcast as well for lots of fun content and interviews that you will not find on Facebook. That's a wrap. We'll see you next week. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in. Join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And please subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Good night.